Okay. All right. So um, I'd like to welcome you all for coming tonight and joining us in our fifth webinar in the Noble series of preparing our students for the global workplace. And our guest tonight is Melissa Suar, who is a Spanish teacher at Hempsfield School District in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. who I think I met and discovered her through a LinkedIn group. I saw her Correct. post something about medical Spanish and I stalked her down and mm -hmm. um, she has now been presenting and sharing her ideas in her model. Um, at the AATSP conference last summer, and she'll be presenting again in Colorado in April for the LSP uh, conference. So we're glad to have her here tonight to share her uh, materials and ideas. Um, before we get started any further, I wanted to find out where everyone is joining us from. I, did, I didn't do a poll this time, but if uh, you want to just type in the chat box where you're here from, from? I'm in Florida. St. Pete, DC. Indiana, okay. Ohio. Oh, Rhode Island, okay. Oh, in Canada, yay, we got wow. Erica, my, I guess maybe farthest away, I don't know. Our last guest. Oh, hey, Sean. Glad to see you're here. Oh, and by the way, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Mary Reisner, and um, I started the Noble Group, and I work at the University of Florida at the Center for Latin American Studies. So, um, so we got a good um, crowd spread or spread around uh, the country. So that's great. Uh, just a quick commercial about uh, the Noble website and um, some of the Noble materials. If you go to mble.org, you'll find materials for developing a program uh, on a variety of topics, medical Spanish, business, language, etc. We have advocacy materials that you can use in your district and just a variety of um, language resources across uh, different languages uh, tonight happens to be medical Spanish because that's kind of the most common one right now. But for anybody that teaches any other language, you can certainly use this as a model. Is anybody on? Is anybody joining us tonight teaching a language other than Spanish? If you put in the chat box. Oh right, Margaret's German. Yay. Okay, we do have a representative from another language. Hammer, hey, do you do Korean? Oh, in French, great. Okay, yeah, it's it's great if we get more diversity because th there is a majority teaching Spanish. Okay. All right. So, how can you collaborate with Noble? Real quick, just um, participate in the Noble social networks, um, help with ideas for future webinar topics, um, present with Noble at conferences, and connect with us to help you develop a course. Uh, Upcoming webinars, we got two more this semester. Margaret's here with us tonight. She'll be talking about business case studies with her colleague Anna Helm from George Washington University. And in April, we'll have a professor from Spain coming to talk to us about a survey she's done about medical Spanish. And in May and June, uh, we'll be posting a call to get some suggestions and ideas from other people for fall 2014. Because um, pretty much so far, I've just been identifying people I know of that are doing great things, but I know other people have to be doing some uh, interesting stuff that we want to hear about as well. So um, we're going to turn the cameras off um, just to save and not disconnect. And I'll put Melissa back on once we get to Q&A. And just so you know, during uh, or while Melissa is talking, please just write in comments, questions in the chat box so you don't forget anything that comes to mind because we want to be sure to come back and cover that during the Q&A. And if Melissa, you know, 
sees something in the chat box and feels like she can jump in and cover it at the moment, that's that's um, her option. So here, we're going to hand it over to Melissa. Thanks for join, um, coming to share your materials with us tonight, Melissa. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I was going to speak tonight a, a little about how I started the Spanish for Healthcare course because I do not have a medical background and how I'm, why I went about doing that. And then through that course, really had some uh, retrospective uh, reflections on my teaching, which has really made me a better teacher of Spanish in general outside of the Spanish for Healthcare course. And that would be the moving, moving beyond rote skills. Um, so just to talk about a little bit about Spanish for healthcare, um, I I did teach a, a Spanish level one and two in a nursing college. However, um, what I had discovered that the students didn't have enough of the conversational skills at that level to to communicate with patients, which is what they really needed. Because although um, now you should be hiring an interpreter in a medical setting. We we know from working with the nurses and the staff that it does not happen. And if you know any bit of Spanish, you're you're pulled in and you're requested to to help out. So the nurses needed to be able to communicate. And at a basic level one and two, it, it just wasn't happening. Um, so I thought I I teach at a very big high school. We have about 2,400 students in 9 through 12, and I felt there had to be uh, a way to incorporate, there had to be enough students going into some field of healthcare um, that I could propose this course. So selfish reasons, when I came on board at the district, as many of you well know, um, a lot of times there is a hierarchy, and so new teachers tend to kind of stick with levels one and two for quite some time. Um, and so this was a, an additional reason, I guess, I, I kind of wanted to teach something upper level. Um, and, and in that respect, maybe it was a bit selfish, but I felt that it would also be a useful course. And I wanted to see some practicality with the language. And I felt it would be more useful as an upper level high school course than a new course for college. Um, so I approached the department coordinator. She was so supportive and, and really felt that it would be a great course to offer. Um, we agreed together and discussed a pre prerequisite of having a high school uh, level four, and we teach on the block schedule um, in my district. So um, we, we went through that. Um, I had, <laughs> at the time, you know, the pie in the sky, I'm going to set this up. This is going to be great. I'm going to teach upper levels. And it was a lot more work um, than I anticipated, but very much worth it. Um, but the, the work beforehand was definitely longer than I, I anticipated. And with being so budget conscious, um, and the schools at that point were already starting to see the effects of some of the, the economic crunch, um, we were very careful about proposing a course and not purchasing textbooks. Um, so what I ended up doing was purchasing uh, a few things as reference, mostly for me. Um, one small item, a type of reference book for the students that stayed on the shelf in the classroom as a classroom set. And those were purchased in paperback. They were purchased in, on Amazon as a classroom set of 30. They stayed in my room. And so the cost of, of putting the course together was very, very low. Um, under under 2000 probably even under 1500 or $1,200. Um, and I did not charge the district to develop the course or anything like that. I knew, I knew what I needed to do to get it approved, basically. Um, so the first semester that the course ran, I, I t we teach six sections um, per year on the block schedule. We have three classes a semester. One is our prep, so we teach six sections. Out of the six sections, four were healthcare. So I was quite shocking, but I understand when you introduce a new course, that often happens. You have many who will take it, and then it sort of levels out. And that's exactly what it did. Um, what I did when I approached this was I approached the course knowing that I couldn't possibly give everyone everything they needed out of a healthcare course. Some were going to be interested in the veterinary uh, field, some in, in the dentist field, some in the medical on the doctor side. And so I basically wanted to give 
the most skills I could possibly give um, where they could take that to any office. And I sort of mapped out 10 basic units. And I, I planned and planned and planned. And what happened was the kids, in the first day and a half, my whole week of materials were just eaten up. Um, so you're, these are level five students. They're, they've elected to take this. Um, so it's truly an elective because those who want it really want to be in the classroom. So they were very motivated students. Um, not your typical students who would take a, a level one and two because they are fulfilling a, a requirement per se. So they did gobble up my work. And I, for the rest of that first semester, I was pretty much only a day ahead of the kids. Um, it, it was a lot of work. Um, you understand that you're developing everything, every vocabulary word, every activity and context, every everything you could imagine. So I, I basically determined what grammar lent well towards each unit. Um, for example, um, patient intake and office visit, determining the reason for the visit. Um, I, I paired that up with commands, but I concentrated on new stead form. So, um, or, the in, or the formal form for those that are not in, in the chat for um, Spanish. So um, that's the way I approached it. Uh, it did. <laughs> I did, like I said, I was only a day ahead of, of the kids a few times. So after the first time you, you run through it, you do feel like a first year teacher the first year through. And, and I think that's to be expected. Um, what the, I knew what the nursing students were looking for, and that was the ability to speak. And, and that wasn't being delivered with a level one and two. Um, so I, I approached this as a communicative course. And as far as supplemental materials, I'm happy to share what I use as a refer as reference points, but again, teaching in a a post secondary institution at a level one and two just was not enough vigor or rigor to give a level five in the high school. So I really did put a lot of work into supplementing those ideas and expanding upon those ideas, but um, definitely everything that I created was from scratch. So um, the other thing that, that I wanted to concentrate on with the course was I knew that those in the course would be faced with interpretation much of the time, which up until that point in, in the language learning community, we tend to frown on, on interpretation. Um, but I knew that this was going to be integral for this course. So I did have to explain that we did a lot of practice with interpreting what people are saying from one language to the other or from target language back into English. Um, and so we, we, we understood that from the beginning and the course was going to be about communicating. Um, there's a question in the chat box about why I was limited to beginning students for the nursing students. The nursing students where I was teaching, the college that I was teaching at, that was an elective for the nursing students to keep a full-time schedule and to keep their, their financial aid. So the nursing students that were taking it, although it was an elective, to them a lot of times it was really only to make sure they were taking a full schedule of classes to keep their financial aid. And they that nursing program is well known for being very very rigorous and i don't think those students could have handled an upper level type of course anyway i did have a lot of requests from the staff at the um, hospital that the hospital is quite large and, and very well known a lot of requests from staff to give courses or audit courses that i was teaching um, but with the schedules that they have and the shift work that they have, it just didn't work out well to teach the upper levels with the communication that I was looking for. So in the high school classroom, those that register for the course would have completed up through level four, and then they are going into a field of health, or perhaps they're even minoring in Spanish, and they just want, they love Spanish and love, want more Spanish. Um, or they love German and they want more German, or they plan to um, minor in, in something that's going to get them exposure to that other culture. And so uh, that's who takes the course in high school. Um, who teaches the course? At this point, I can tell you 
there were, has been no one else to volunteer um, because uh, as you all know, teaching anything new is, it's quite cumbersome, especially at the beginning. Um, and so it's offered me a bit of job security because uh, I proposed it, I designed it, I made the book and so I'm teaching it. Um, no one has said I would like to teach that ever. Um, so in that respect, it's given me a, a bit of job security, but at the same time, it's it's so refreshing to be doing something a little bit different. And my focus is a little different in that classroom, and the students are a little different in that classroom. And so the experience is totally different than teaching the regular Spanish levels one through four. So when you think about designing a new course and you think about the things going on in your life i'm sure no one says oh i have tons of time please pick me now um there's just no good time um <laughs> uh it depends on your district and how supportive they are uh, for new ventures and especially with languages with all that we have going on um but i my suggestion is if you can implement something new, even if you feel um, bogged down or weighed down or overwhelmed, try to get it implemented so that you have students taking the courses, so that you have justification to keep the course and maybe keep a person's position or part of a position um, because the students are interested in it. Um, and after the first year, the rewards definitely outweigh the workload. Um, the type of students signing up for courses like this, they love the language. They want to use the language. They don't want to walk away and say, gee, I took four years of, of Spanish or four years of German or four years of French and I don't remember a thing. These are the kids that want to use what they have. Um, so they they're, tend to be very self-motivated students. Um, Uh, we were looking, where do we go now? Um, we've had some economic struggles and um, we, we've we been kind of, our district has, has been really struggling economically and still still is struggling. So I had been approached to teach this, this course online, which I would, I would venture to say I would never teach a language course online. However, when you're being faced with um, teaching an elective course and, and my mode of thinking was uh, I will do anything to make myself more valuable to my district and therefore hopefully keep my job. So I did agree to uh, try to teach this level online um, and so that, that completely revamped the course um, and completely changed everything and threw me back into first year teacher mode. So, um, it, but I like challenges also, and again, I was, I'm in the mode of thinking where I would like to make myself as valuable as I can to my district. So um, I did have the rewards. I, I had the, the students go through. One of the things that's a big thing in, in my course is a, a complete patient intake, which means their, their demographic information, their family history, and, and their, their lifestyle history. And so, what I have the students do, it, it becomes part of the final exam. We do it in parts, but they, they must take a patient intake form in English, and they must verbally go through that with me and be able to get all of the information as if I didn't speak English. And so that was one of the bigger parts, not bigger in terms of value, bigger in terms of culminating because it lasted all all semester but at the end the kids go through and they get the information from me and and we do it together face to face and uh, it's rewarding that way and I, I have had kids come back to me and say I'm so thankful that you had us do that because that's one of the things that I'm asked to do most in my office um, and yes I do I do a role play and I am the patient and the student is sort of the intermediary and so they have the English patient intake form, which I just, I, I'll be happy to share mine. Um, and then they basically have to get the information from me being the patient. And um, that is a, a portion of their final exam grade. Um, 
And some of the challenges, just to be totally upfront with everyone, um, it depends on your district, it depends on your supervisor. Um, there is no work on the part of the supervisor other than supporting you, um, getting the course approved and going through the proper channels and processes to get that approved, getting it into the curriculum guides so that students can choose it, um, making sure that they share the information with others in the department or however your school does registration for um, next semesters and, and recommendations. In my district, recommendations are done by teachers for all core classes plus language. And so we have certain parameters set for when you can move on and we do the course recommendation. So other teachers needed to, they need to know that this is being offered. So that, that comes into play with your supervisor. So as you all know, no matter how much you prepare, you're just never prepared for every situation in teaching. You never are, but you, you really are not when you are teaching something new. So um, just hang in there the first time you teach it. Be over prepared as you could be. Um, and um, just do your best with it and give them, give them a value for what they're taking in the course for the reason that they're taking the course. Um, not having a healthcare background, there were questions that I didn't have answers to. And I would flat out say, I, I don't know that, I will have to find out for you. Some of the things I did know um, because I was at the nursing college and so I had some information, some of their questions I did not know. And I'm comfortable enough with my students to say, I, you know, I, I just don't know the answer to that. I'll, I'll have to get back to you. And then I would um, check. I have a few friends who are RNs and doctors and just check to make sure I have the information correct and consult other sources. Um, but one, one thing you have to realize or recognize when you teach this course and really make sure the students understand that there is a liability component to working in the medical field. And that's one thing you must be very cautious of, um, that students understand the risks that they have when they interpret. So I have always told my students, when you're interpreting, if it's something serious, a serious diagnosis, or you feel uncomfortable, you must say, I am not comfortable. I think we need to bring in the um, hired interpreter for this. So there is a liability portion. So for what I'm doing with the students, it's more of a, an office visit type setting or a, a diagnostic visit type of setting. Um, I do have connections um, with some of the local clinics or doctor's office offices um, and with the nursing college. Um, and so that part is helpful um, so, so that I can consult various sources. Um, when I prepared the course, uh, you'll see when I, when I share some of what, what I teach in the course, uh, I'm not teaching the students how to do procedures. Like I'm not teaching the students how to take a blood pressure or how to, um, determine if someone is in respiratory distress. I'm teaching them how to communicate in a medical setting. So therefore, what I'm doing wouldn't come back on me and have any liability issues, okay? So I'm focusing on the communication with the patient, not the skills or the abilities necessarily related to a medical field. Uh, <laughs> When, when you're creating a new course, and especially if you're on a budget crunch like we were, this means that you will basically be creating everything. And so what I did was the first uh, semester that I created everything, I kind of put everything together and the, the next semester I ran it, it was a book. And so I'm so fortunate that I work in a district large enough where we have a print shop who print for us and they will make books for us. And so I used my materials. I, I put them all together and, and made a PDF file of my materials. And then I started using a book. So I would send this book to the print shop 
instead of having to copy everything. Because as you can imagine, if you're creating everything, that means you, you're copying everything you do. Uh, there are ways to cut down on copying that we did use in the classroom, but at that time we weren't experimenting with one-on-one -on -one, um, with devices or anything like that. The most I could do was get a computer cart once or, or so per week. Um, so the copying can get a little cumbersome. So you will want to consider ways that you maybe flip some of your lessons, um, if you've learned about that at all. That is letting the students learn the material at home and come to school and practice the material with you, or just doing some different things to use technology so that you're not copying everything if you don't have access, like me, to a print shop who can make you a book. Um, some of the other challenges, some, some of your peers can be very negative because they know you're getting an upper level course. And as you know, sometimes it takes many years to get from coming in on a teaching on a level, level one and two until people finally retire and you get bumped up the kind of scale there and you, you're getting the upper level kids. So that could be an issue. It depends on your peers. Um, my answer for that is, is always very simple. You, you may propose a new course. That, that's totally up to you. Um, but see, people, they like to complain sometimes, and um, but then sometimes there's no follow through. So I always just say, well, you, you could propose a new course. Um, the other thing is just first year numbers will be higher, um, and then after that it sort of evens out. So my classes are still pretty large. They wouldn't be on, uh, on the chopping block for only having six or eight students and possibly being cut. Um, the last portion of the slide here talks about the admonition for healthcare course. I already spoke to the liability portion, and again, I just want to reiterate that I'm not teaching skills or things that students would learn if they were attending medical school or nursing school. I'm teaching communication with patients. Um, so that takes me out of the liability portion. Um, so where do we go from here? I, I'm just looking at, at what I've done in the in the classroom traditionally, um, our school has typically been pretty bound by curriculum. I, I, I must say we're, we very much like to, to adopt a formula or format and, and everyone's supposed to, to stick to it. So for that reason, we tend to stick to books and, and curriculum. Um, so those of us that aren't TPR or TPRS teachers, we we have a little routine we've gotten used to, and those of us who are my age, uh, that's how we learn too. I learned in high school um, the same way that my kids were learning. We learn some vocabulary, do some drills, quiz that out, move on to the grammar, drill, practice, practice, speak, speak, quiz that out, you know, and, and the routine kind of went, and you, you kind of insert little fun things, and I, I was looking for ways to add more production in my regular classrooms, and I had developed some great ways to develop the, the production, but when this course came about, I really needed to have all students um, motivated to speak. And so in your regular classroom, production happens for confident students or vocal students or participatory students or motivated students but not everyone. And so I needed to get them all there. And so I had to think about what am I going to do to get all of them to speak and to get away from this drill and, and quiz sort of format that they're, they're all so used to. Um, we so want to attach grades to things and we like to have a nice neat tied up in a bow and it's in the grade book. And, and parents want that, and districts want that to an extent at times. So I began to think about, okay, language is communication, okay? Communication happens when two people understand each other. That is not perfect. It's certainly not perfect among native speakers of English. It's certainly not perfect among native speakers of other languages. And so I d determined that I was going to allow imperfection and I was going to just make sure from the very beginning that everyone was super comfortable in my classroom and I have always done that to 
to an extent, but I, I completely changed things around. So with my goal being production, I really needed to make sure I wasn't focusing on the rote skills. So more production in the target language, getting away from the rote, rote skills, you, you start from day one. So you establish an environment that's based on production and not perfection. You, I'm happier if the students are speaking in the target language. If it's atrocious, if it's horrible, obnoxious, wrong, I don't correct them. I might restate something and say it correctly after they've said it incorrectly, but I never directly address them or say that they've said something wrong. If they're speaking, I, I'm thrilled. Um, and so I don't, I don't correct them in, in this classroom setting for, for speaking. Um, the pencil and paper assessments have their value and that's what we as Americans are so conditioned to need to give grades. Um, and so I, I changed that around a bit and I gave those less value and I gave more value to speaking assessments and presentations and participation. I had to be a little creative with it because my district is getting strict about what we can give grades for. Um, right now they're still allowing participation grades in the language classroom, but we do have a very detailed rubric on it, um, which I have for everything. And, and I suggest for anyone to do just to cover yourself. But there is a classroom of acceptance. So if they speak and they don't say something correctly or they're sharing and it sounds terrible, I make no faces. I, I'm, I act like I'm the happiest person in the world. Um, I'm very conscientious about my volunteerism. Uh, there's always students that raise their hands and then the students that don't raise their hands want to lean on those students and they think, well, they'll do it. So I've been very selective about that so that I correct that in the first week or two weeks. Those that are weak, I will call on them and offer them an either or, a yes, no, or an option of two things so that they have an easier time answering until I can bring them along in their confidence level. Then I will gradually give them uh, a, a chance to produce maybe, or a, uh, maybe a closed activity where they're giving me a portion of something. The weaker students, that's how I bring them along so that they are comfortable enough as everyone else until I can get them all producing. Um, spontaneous classroom activities and things that get them all speaking, the practicality of it is what I really wanted to emphasize, okay? And you you can't have practicality if, if they cannot speak or will not speak or are too shy to speak. So um, I, I implemented a lot of activities. One of my favorite things that I start with at the beginning of the year, I just called it speed dating. I throw uh, a question on the whiteboard or the screen up front. My classroom is set up in a W. And so one row stays put, one row moves one direction only, and they move a different person every after each question is answered. So in the beginning, I'll put the question and perhaps maybe the first few words of how they should be answering. They each take turns, and then when something rings or the screen changes, the one row moves and they have a new partner. They get to know every single person in the classroom. They aren't in front of a room in front of everyone. They're simply with one other person but I can contain them and make sure they're all doing it. It's fast, no one's under the gun, and it helps get everyone speaking. And so that's one of the activities that I do. Another one that I do is instead of memorizing vocabulary, they, they must come up with a description of what the vocabulary item does, how it works, what it's for. Um, and so when we develop that a little further, then we will play what's called taboo, where you describe the item to your partner, and I will do the same thing. They will move partners, describe two or five or so many, and they're trying to guess what the vocabulary is so that they have a working understanding. And the, also the understanding is if, if you're with a patient and you can't remember the word for something, you can describe what it is so that they understand. And so my thing with these students has always been if I'm a patient and I can understand what you're saying, I will not penalize you if you are communicating with me. 
although your communication may not be perfect. If you're communicating and I can understand, you will get credit. And so the students have a little less stress that way. I do push them to develop their skills and push them for their own personal growth and push them to get out of their comfort zone a little bit to use usted um, or the formal form rather than what they're more familiar with in the in the um, two form in Spanish. And so I will push those things. But however, if they were with a patient and the patient understood what they were saying, I think I'm okay with that. And so that's what I've been working on with them as far as developing the skills and having the ability to speak and just not feel on display when they're speaking. And so eventually, I tell them you're all at different spots, but eventually the hope is we kind of even out so we're kind of in a, a range that's more close to each other. And so we will do activities like taboo or scattergories or outbursts, or I have a box of cards that's a game in English called What's Yours Like? And on it are things that you describe. And you don't tell what the word is, but you describe what yours is like. For example, um, if the word was refrigerator, you might say, in Spanish, you would describe it, or in the target language, well, mine is always full of pizza and soda. And the next person might say, mine is white, and mine has, you know, and they would describe something else. And so everyone's getting a chance to describe what theirs is like, and they're using the language uh, spontaneously. So I'm not giving them prompts, and they must put it together. And so that has helped tremendously. Um, other things like hot potato, where you put maybe five vocabulary words in a bag, and you pass the bag around, and when the music stops, whoever has the bag must blindly pull a, a piece of paper out and describe to the people in the group, again, it's a group activity, what the item is, what it does. They may not use English. They must describe it. And so just ways to get them to spontaneously speak. Um, so speed dating, taboo, what's yours like. Um, the the mine one is called um, what's yours like. It's an English uh, game that's just a little box of cards. There are hundreds of different things to describe, and it just helps them to think outside the box. And so I have said to them, if you you have to get out of the mentality that you need an exact word for everything, you must discover use the language that you know to your advantage and to help you communicate even though you might not know the word. And so um, we work on that. Um, another thing I do with the medical Spanish that you could do is a bag full of complaint cards. And the person will, you could practice interpretation, and someone pulls out and they say, I have this, this, and this. And then the doctor will give instructions. Different, different things depending on what we're doing. And so different ways to practice different things, just with spontaneous speaking, um, which is what you want the students to do because they're not going to be in a contained classroom where they have prompts or they have a list on their desk or, or something like that. So the idea is the production. Another thing I've done, this has nothing to relate with medical Spanish, but another activity I've, I've done there's these old cartoons. They're called Hocus Focus. There are two photos or drawings, line drawings, and you find the differences between the two pictures. I let the kids race at it. I let them come up with a, with a partner and figure out what they are. Obviously, they have to be in the target language. Um, if they don't know what an item is, they can describe it to me. But again, they're in a smaller setting. They're working with a partner. They're not standing in front of the classroom presenting. They're not um, being graded for a dialogue or a play or writing a poem or, or something of that nature. They're just concentrating on spontaneous production of the target language. And so there are tons of activities. I have tons and tons and tons of activities that help with the spontaneous production. And um, another thing I might say is keep filler activities um, in your desk. Um, in case, <coughs> excuse me, 
keep filler activities on hand because there will be days when you think something should take about 20, 30 minutes and they finish it up in five. And so keep filler activities and those are good for filler activities also. <clears throat> and then lastly, when you look at rote skills and assessment and context and immersion, if you want to get beyond rote skills, you have to move beyond rote assessments. This is challenging because we do, <coughs> excuse me, we do tend to lean on these assessments and I mean obviously we have some weight on these types of assessments. <coughs> excuse me. So to do this, the students have to get out of their comfort zone. <coughs> of course, wouldn't you know I'd be coughing. <coughs> I'm so sorry, excuse me. But you, you start the process on day one. Baby steps with the volunteerism. <coughs> I'm so sorry, Mary. <coughs> um, the students expect that they have to participate. Oh, I'm drinking water. Um, context everywhere. Stay, stay in context. If you have to sing, jump, dance, do charades, whatever it takes, stay in the target language. Um, it sends a message to the kids that you're not going to resort to English to explain something to them. So you set the example. You explain what something is without explaining what it is in English. You explain by by showing, by role play, by acting it out, whatever you have to do. So that you are, are showing that you are in this. This is what we do when we have to communicate with a patient or a client or customer who doesn't speak your language. And so the kids will get used to that. Um, keep it the context in everything. So when you develop your vocabulary lists and your grammatical things that your points that you want to hit <coughs> or teach keep that vocabulary in everything you do so when you develop your grammatical activities you throw the same vocabulary in those vocabulary throw the same vocabulary in the grammatical things that you practice in the speed dating that you do on the on the whiteboard or on the screen in the taboo that you're playing with the students or that the students are playing with each other where they are describing something. And another word about taboo, another way I use it beyond having them explain simply a vocabulary word, you can do taboo with everyday items because your goal is to, to get them to communicate in target language. And so if if they're if they're enhancing their skills by communicating in the target language but it's not using your vocabulary that time, I'm okay with that too. So I've given the kids a list, like student A has a list and student B has a list. And for example, on student A's list, there might be, let's think of a new word that these kids know now called selfie. Okay, every kid knows what a selfie is. A selfie is a self-portrait. It's short for taking a self-portrait of yourself and posting it somewhere, Instagram or Snapchat. And so the student who, student A, has selfie on their paper, and they are trying to get student B to say the word selfie. And they've got to describe to the student what it is, but they may not use the word selfie or any portion of the word self or any variation of it. And so they're still using their language skills and calling on all those things they've learned in their previous courses to come up with this description. There's no pressure on them to perform. They're doing it with a partner. And so they practice those things so they understand how to do taboo. And then as we get into the medical terminology, then they will know what to do when you have a list for student A and student B, and it's your vocabulary. And so, for example, um, let's say the word is cardiologist. So instead of knowing the word cardiologist, obviously that's, um, if the word is similar in, in English and Spanish. So they would describe this person in Spanish in the target language. 
this person specializes in studying the heart and sickness and illness of the heart. And if that person doesn't understand what the person's saying, perhaps they're not pronouncing very well, or perhaps they just have no idea what they're saying. They have to come up with another way to describe cardiologists. And so they must think of something else. Now, in taboo, I don't let them do charades. They have to use language skills only. So Okay, I think we just lost Melissa. <laughs> huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing she will log back on. Um, in the meantime, I was actually just sending her a note to say to go ahead and start concluding so we could see if people have questions. That's interesting because the other day when we were testing this out, it was my, I was the one that cut out. Yeah, for some, yeah, she just sent me a text, so she's going to have to log back in. Um, so while we wait for her to get back online, does anybody have any questions or um, comments, thoughts? I was kind of hoping people might put... Oh, she's back. Okay. Okay. Oh, I got to give, um, I have to give her microphone rights again. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Okay. Okay. We, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Should I keep going, Mary? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, or if we could start closing, so people can maybe get some questions going. We got a few in the chat box, and right. we can turn over the microphone for anyone that wants to speak and not type. Just um, let me know. Raise your hand or put a note in the chat box, and I'll give you microphone rights. Okay. Um, I see a question about the book. Um, this is a sort of a sticky subject for me. I signed away my intellectual property rights when I started teaching the course online. Uh, I'm happy to share all of my uh, units and what I'm doing, my topics. I can share vocabulary lists. I can share anything. I just can't give you the entire book. I'm teaching it online for high school.
and to my knowledge, there is no certification for teaching this or anything because I'm not teaching skills. It's asynchronous. So as part of the online course, we have combined with two other districts. So I have students outside of my own district. Um, but um, to, to go back to Sean, I, I can easily and happily share with you portions and pieces and anything I have in, in a single file or Separate files, I should say. I just can't hand over the book. Melissa, I'm going to go ahead and, mac and maximize the chat so people can see better. Okay. Okay, that's good. <laughs> it does sound very daunting to start something new that's whole new um, at, at, from the beginning. <laughs> Um, and when you don't have the background, which I did not either. Um, and so basically, I can, I can send you my, uh, what units I've chosen and what I do with them. Um, you can message me privately or email me, um, and I'm happy to share what I have. Uh, I'm happy to share my course syllabus um, and things like that so you can kind of get an idea. Um, general medical topics that I cover, um, chapter 1 and chapter 10, chapter 1 is patient intake, demographics, um, health history, family history, chapter 10 is release and home care instructions, and then in between um, I give uh, different subjects on each thing. For example, one is car accidents and first responders, um, car accidents is a part of it, first responders being um, EMTs and those types of things. Uh, one is suicide and depression. There's a unit on therapy, um, occupational, physical, and acupuncture therapy. Um, I have units on uh, well child visits. Um, I have unit. I have a unit on. Gosh, I should have the the book nearby me, but I don't. I have to open up a new tab here and look. I can tell you what they all are. Um, email, um, it's melissa.swar at gmail.com, my first name, dot last name, at gmail.com, and um, I'll tell you what my uh, topics are here. Um, heart attacks, high blood pressure, car accidents, prescriptions, instructions, first responders, depression and suicide, uh, childhood illnesses and common uh, symptoms for kids, uh, unexplained illnesses such as chronic fatigue, and therapy and sports injuries, and then release from the hospital or, or provider, instructions, and then home care. Those are the 10 chapters. I would be happy to do a presentation at IUP. Thank you for that link. Um, Mary, do you know, can we put a screenshot in the chat or no? I guess I can try, huh? Yeah, you can give it a try. Okay. So needless to say, the assessment portion was something I really had to rediscover because when a, a student's taking an online course, you realize that the, the literal world and further is at their fingertips just a tab away. And so one thing I didn't mention that I should have mentioned is when you are giving assessments uh, and you want to go away from rote skills, Think about phrasing the questions. For example, instead of, okay, the word for scale in Spanish <clears throat> uh, that, that you weigh yourself on, 
is a bascula. And so instead of saying uh, fill in the blank and what is this when I want the patient to, to know the way to the patient, I'm going to ask them to get on the blank. Okay, well, instead of doing a question like that, you want to phrase your questions such as, which of the following four sentences best demonstrates the meaning of the word scale? And then they really have to understand. They can't use Google Translate. They can't go anywhere. They really have to understand the word. They, they have to get away from, if you're a good memorizer, you get good grades in high school. And I wanted to get away from that. And so I started phrasing my assessments in that way so that I could really see who understands and who just great at memorizing. Um, so that was one of the things I failed to mention. Um, I teach online and face-to-face, -face, not each semester, online's just this semester, it just started. It's my first time. I've been developing the online course for two and a half years and it just was now ready to go finally. And so this semester I just have uh, online. And there are credentials for medical interpretation. In fact, there are even even trying to go to the hospital and work and being a fluent Spanish speaker, you go through rigorous testing. They used to have native speakers come in and volunteer, and they're not even permitted to do that anymore in the medical setting. And so, um, but I had nurses in my classroom telling me that the doctors do not care, and when a doctor wants to know an answer, he's not going to wait for an interpreter to arrive. And so if you're in the room or you're nearby and you know Spanish, you're going to be called. And so that's when I've explained them to the students that you have to understand what your liability is and your comfort level. And, and we do talk about that a lot. So typically, though, we're not in such high pressure medical situations. These students have been more in office type, office visit type settings. So um, it, it's, been, it's been interesting. The online course differs a lot from the face-to-face -face class. In the face-to-face -face class, I can assess if they understand something from the looks on their faces. Online, the only way you understand, if they understand, is if they are giving you some type of feedback, whether it's a file they're handing in, a recording that they're recording, a, a screenshot, a screen recording, a podcast, something. So it's very teacher-heavy in terms of grading. It's, I'll be honest, I, I don't know that I will sign up to teach an online course again. Um, face to face, it's a lot easier for me to get the production. Online, I feel I feel a move back towards the rote skills, which is not something I want to uh, attach myself to or to promote anymore. So we'll see. Um, I, I don't know that I'll volunteer to teach it again because, like I said, it's just very heavy on me doing everything. Uh, communication activities in the online class are harder, more difficult. I, I do forums um, in the online class, and so in the forums, I don't correct grammar, spelling. I, I don't even restate in the forums. I just want them speaking, and so we've been speaking in forums, but like I said, we only just started, and we've had so much snow here that we haven't had uh, a, an opportunity to, de to develop continuity with the course, and so they I need to get them a little more comfortable yet. They don't know that they're going to be recording themselves, but they will be. Um, so we are going to be doing that. And yes, we will be using, I use both Audacity and Linked. Um, and depending on their system, they are able to use GarageBand um, or, or other alternatives to screen recordings. And I've been very, very um, lenient with how they hand things in. They may take a screenshot and text it to me. They can hand it in on a Dropbox online. They can tweet it to me. And so those are some interesting technological things that I'm, I'm loving using because I am a little techie nerd. But um, the production portion of the online course, I'm disappointed in at this point, And I need to develop them further to make sure they do have those skills. Um, so we, they, they don't know it yet, but as I said, they will be recording themselves. I just need to get them to a spot where they're a little more comfortable before I have them do that. And then I will require something very short to start. And I have some embedded videos that they are interpreting for me by native speakers. 
and they're going that direction at this point. Um, and they're, they're doing okay with that. They need a little practice. And as I said, being on block schedule, so there, there is a gap sometimes of a year, possibly more since the last time they had Spanish. So I just need to get them a little more comfortable. If any of you are interested in any materials or tools or um, examples of anything I've mentioned, feel free to email me. My school address is on the screen. My personal email address is melissa.swar at gmail.com. Um, the Twitter that's up there I'm using right now for my class, um, but you can also tweet me or direct message me, and I'm happy to share anything with anyone to get you started because I do believe in having the practicality and the usefulness to the language because there's no purpose in, in learning a language that you can't go forth and use. And so I'm really um, thankful to Noble for promoting um, languages that you can use for a specific purpose. <laughs> sure. That's great. I think it's awesome. I think it makes us more valuable as educators. Um, I think it helps us, and I don't have my doctorate, so I was teaching in a college um, simply because they didn't, were unable to find someone with a doctorate to teach. So I was unable, I was able to teach without a doctorate in the post-secondary level. And so I, I do think even having the experience makes you more valuable as an educator and just as a professional. Yes, Mary has my course proposal. Um, I removed the name. I, you don't have the signed one, but you have what I had filled out and how I proposed the course. Um, and so you can look at my phraseology of how I made it sound when I was proposing it and how uh, it would be a course that would be of great use to other students who are moving off into the post-secondary world, whether they're going to college or they're going into the workforce, it just was a great opportunity for them to use those skills in a way where they could walk away and have something to show for it. Yeah, and I'll also post a course proposal sample that we have for a Language for Leadership course. I think it's um, going to be helpful if people can see what other people have proposed so they don't have to start from zero when they're trying to yeah. get new courses pushed through. Uh, the question is, ha have the students been able to take follow-up courses when they get to the university level? Um, so they have not. Honestly, this course or medical Spanish or specialized courses, even in the university level, they are starting to pop up more, but they're not as common. And in my area, we certainly don't have any. The only thing they had was basic Spanish one and two at the nursing college. And so uh, the student, my students moving on have more skills and abilities in, in conversational and communication than the students in, in the college. So um, I wish they could continue on with it, but I, I don't know how. I, I'm finishing my second master's, and I don't know if I'm going forward for my doctorate. I'd like to, but I don't know how long my district will continue to fund that, too, in the, in the economic crunch we're having. So at some point, I would like to move on to post-secondary, but... Um, there's a question posted for service learning. Um, I had great ideas of doing service learning. I'm going to be perfectly honest. I was going to connect with so-and-so and such-and-such, -and, -such, and I was going to bring this person in. And when I taught the course, oh, there were days I was literally running from the copy room to the classroom um, right before the buzzer rang. And so I didn't get those things set up. 
and uh, I probably should. However, I know that um, the nursing college that's here, I think that they're kind of not not put out, but they're just my my students are able to walk away with more practicality than than they have, and so it's been harder to connect with the nursing community. And the nursing community is very elite in some aspects, and so that's been a little bit hard to break into, but. I will certainly check into that again because especially with my online course they they would really benefit from something like that and that's a great idea that I had completely forgotten about so I will definitely be checking into that it's a great suggestion Another thing I did in the classroom that the students love and I can't stop them from talking is post a discussion question about a very controversial topic to the students. Um, and they, 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 they love it. It has nothing to do with medical Spanish, but it certainly helped in production. And so, for example, one year we removed seniors were able to skip final exams if they had A's during both marking periods. Well, that was removed, and so the students were in a big brouhaha over it. So that discussion question, they they were able to talk, and if everyone's participating and everyone's communicating, I, I love to have those discussions and let them use their skills and show me what they've learned and what they can do. So just some other different things for more production. Oh, that's wonderful. A university level second year course in medical mission trip to Nicaragua to work with doctors in medical degrees. That is great. Thanks, Annika. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for joining. Anybody that has some links or resources to share, please feel free to post on the Facebook page and then I'll post on the website so it stayed, um, stays